you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to all imagine that you are a, um, a traveling musician um, in Mississippi, in a, near a town called um, Clarksdale on Highway 49 and 61. And you're not a particularly good musician, you're an okay guitarist, and you meet an individual whom perhaps not many of us particularly want to meet, um, you meet the devil. And the devil puts a proposition to you. He says he will make you the greatest guitarist that there has ever been and that there will ever be. But in return, he wants your soul. And I don't know what you would do under those circumstances, but apparently Robert Johnson was in that position and he did the deal. And he did, apparently, become the greatest guitarist ever. I'm told that he played his instruments with fingers dancing on the strings. His voice moaned and wailed, expressing the deepest sorrows of a condemned sinner. And he died at 27 years of age, condemned to hell, I suppose, which incidentally is the same age that Jimi Hendrix died. Um, and the story of the, the link between rock and roll and, um, and the devil grew from that moment. We have songs like Symphony of the Devil, um, Highway to Hell, etc. Or if you play Stairway to Heaven backwards, apparently you can hear the voice of the devil or something, I don't know. But the point is that that story was meant to be the moment when rock and roll, a medium that I think perhaps we all might feel we have some ownership over, was invented. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know about you, but I actually have a problem with that story. I'm not, there's, there's an element to it that I'm not completely convinced over. And um, so just to recap, so we've got the devil, greatest guitarist that had ever been and the greatest guitarist ever will be. I don't know if you agree with me, but I think it's absurd to say that Robert Johnson was a better guitarist than Jimi Hendrix. Um, but there's actually another explanation as to why rock and roll came about, and it's an explanation that I rather like. And it's to do with convergence. When two cultures, uh, a European culture with a traditional in mathematical, sorry, a European musical culture with a tradition in mathematical precision, um, converged with um, an African culture with a more of a, a, a rhythmic emphasis and via Baptist music and the blues, we finally get um, rock and roll. Um, I'll give you some other examples of convergence. Um, when DNA was first discovered by Francis, um, um, by an American biologist called American, uh, James Watson, he worked with an English physicist called Francis Click building on the work of a biochemist called Rosalind Franklin, building on her work on x-rays, and then um, a Russian physicist, an expert on the Big Bang, called George uh, Gamow, um, um, looked at how the four bases of the double helix could control the synthesis of proteins and amino acids. And the point I'm making there is that um, one of the great breakthroughs in our knowledge of the 20th century came about different people working in quite different disciplines coming together and converging. Solar energy is another example of convergence because a lot of the technology that goes into uh, silicon solar panel panels builds upon what was learnt through building um, um, silicon-based um, integrated circuits. Or take an example, energy storage. Um, a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago, three or four decades ago, we didn't really need batteries. Not many of us needed batteries. Kids' torches, kids' toys maybe. And then the laptop came along. And then the mobile phone came along. And suddenly there was a reason why companies should spend money on batteries. So a lot of money was developed on battery technology and it got better and better until finally it's beginning to look as if that technology is relevant to electric cars or even... Um, renewable energies. Or another example is carbon fibre. Initially it was used for very specialist functions such as Formula One. Then it was used for the Airbus A380 and the Boeing 787. And suddenly the cost of carbon fibre came down quite dramatically. So it's beginning to become viable for it to be available in more um, mass market applications. 
Okay, so my name is Michael Baxter. I've co-written a book called I Disrupted, um, which I think you should probably all buy. Um, convergence, one of the claims we make in the book is that we're on the verge of the most radical change in technology ever. We're about to see the world change more completely over the next two or three decades than it, than it changed thanks to the industrial revolutions of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century combined. And one of the reasons for that is convergence. And one of the powerful things about convergence is you kind of don't see it coming because it comes from sort of somewhere over there. It comes from a sector you don't, you're not necessarily familiar with, which is why a lot of companies fail to spot new trends. Another example, which I think is a great driver of this, is Moore's Law. Now, when I say Moore's Law, I don't mean literally Moore's Law, which was defined by um, Gordon Moore at Intel in the mid-60s. I'm talking about it more as a metaphor to describe how certain technologies can change at a geometric rate. At a geometric rate. As it happens, Moore's Law, in its literal sense, is probably coming to an end. It's probably only got um, a few iterations to go before computers that are based on um, silicon-based integrated circuits stop doubling in power every 18 months. But that doesn't mean to say we're coming to the point when computers cease to be more, become more powerful. Uh, you've got technologies such as well, graphene, quantum computing, spintronics, which means that actually, or well, the way we say it is, Moore's law is dead, long live Moore's law. Another example of that um, is solar power. Uh, the cost of one unit of energy generated from solar panel today is 1%, 1% of what it was 35 years ago. Or another example is energy storage. Uh, last year, Tesla's C CTO, co-founder uh, JB Strawball, said battery innovation is improving around 5 to 8% per year. The impact of battery innovation on the design of the car can be even more significant than Moore's law on some computing products. Or Craig Ventner, um, a famous geneticist that many of you might be familiar with, back in 2007 in an interview on the Richard Dimbledy lecture, he said, our ability to read genetic code is changing even faster, faster than the changes predicted by Moore's law. In fact, the Human Genome Project took 13 years to complete, from 1990 to around about 2003. It cost $2.7 billion. Today, you can have your genome sequenced sequence in a matter of days, or even hours, actually, for, um, for, for a few thousand dollars, maybe even less. It's changing so fast that whatever I tell you will be, will be wrong within a few, few days. So, that's, so there are two reasons why we're about to see these incredible changes in technology. Another reason is the internet. And the in a lot of people are quite cynical about that. They say, well, you can't eat the internet. You can't drink it. You can't wear it. Why is it going, why is it going to be, why is it so significant? A lot of economists get hung up on that one. A lot of economists believe technology innovation peaked in the late 1990s. Um, well, the reason is because just about every decent idea that there has ever been built upon an existing idea. As Isaac, now Isaac Newton was a man who had an ego that was so big that he'd probably have struggled to squeeze it into this room. However, in a rare moment of humility, he said, when asked where his ideas came from, he said, through standing on the shoulder of giants. In fact, he wasn't even being original when he said that. The French philosopher Bernard de Chartres said several centuries earlier, we are like dwarfs standing on the shoulder of giants. No medium in history can facilitate the way ideas build on ideas like the internet can. I would say that there have been four great catalysts for innovation in history. Four great things have happened which have made it possible to spread ideas. The first was the development of speech. The second was the development of the printing press. The third was, sorry, the second was the development of writing. The third was the development of the printing press. And the fourth was the internet. To give you an example, do you remember Apple back in the late 19, or in the mid 1990s? It was on its knees. Um, it flirted with a product called the Newton. It produced a sort of an edutainment concept, con console called the Pippin. 
in, I think it was 1997, even had to get help from Bill Gates in order to survive. Now, I've never met Bill Gates, I'm sure he's a very nice man, but at the time, Apple aficionados felt that just like Robert Johnson, um, Apple had sold its soul to the devil. And yet, look at Apple today, biggest company in the world. And Apple is a classic example of convergence, consumer electronics, computers, mobile phones, photography. And of course, so rapidly has it happened, the likes of Kodak and Nokia have su suffered. Now, what's quite interesting about Nokia, I was reading about that the other day, it did all the things right. I was reading about, that it had, used, to, used to have um, all kinds of meetings and it had but very senior people in trying to work out where the future was going. We need to, we need to work out what technology could disrupt us in the future. Still totally, totally failed to deal with the iPhone, however. So why do I say we've got these, this incredible technological revolution? Well, there are lots of technologies. Um, they include the Internet of Things, wearable technologies, big data, 3D printing, robotics nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, genome sequencing, leading to virtual reality, augmented reality, a complete revolution in healthcare, uh, a new industrial revolution, more efficiency, a sharing economy, and could even change what it is to be a human. One example of all of this, which I'm going to talk about in the concept of, of ownership is, is the autonomous car or the self-driving car. Now, there's been a lot of publicity recently about Apple moving into uh, the car industry. One of the arguments, there are two real arguments for Apple to do that, which, which relate to convergence. One is that Apple really would benefit from being a leading player in the battery industry because it needs good batteries for its iPhones, for its smartphones, and for its... Um, new wearable devices such as watches. And um, to, to do that, in order to exploit the new technologies that are emerging, the nanotechnologies that are out there, it needs economies of scale, which is why, one of the reasons why it also makes sense to look at other technologies that, that build upon batteries, such as cars or renewable energy. Um, in the case of Google, it's looking at um, autonomous cars. Not, I, I don't think because it wants to become a car manufacturer, but because it doesn't want us to have to drive. It wants us to be sitting in a car and searching so that it can make, generate revenue from us. Okay, so with technology, one of the issues here that can, that can surprise people is that often the end user, the customer, doesn't actually realise that they want something. Henry Ford supposedly said, I don't actually think he did say it, but, but mythology says that if you ask people what they want, they would say faster horses. So if the BBC had listened to research, it would never have brought back Doctor Who. If, if Steve Jobs had listened to, the, to research, it would, he would never have introduced a touchscreen phone. One of the pieces of advice that people say in order to avoid that effect is listen to what your customers' customers say. It's not a foolproof method, but it, maybe it's a, a method that could help. And then that brings us on to the subject of sharing economy. Um, millennials are the only generation that believes losing their phone will have a greater negative impact on their life than losing their car. Back in 1998, 64.6% .6 of potential drivers had a driving license as in New York. Um, in 2008, that number was down to 46.3%. The mobility demand of a city like Singapore could be met with 30... Ooh, 30%, I think that says. 30% uh, of its existing vehicles. And the average American spends 95% of his time parked. Another... No, American car, I think that should say. Another 0.8% of his time is spent with the driver looking for a parking space. You get the gist. Um, something quite inefficient about cars, and they're not as popular as they used to be. I'll reword that. The, the growth in demand for, for cars is not accelerating like it used to accelerate, which has led to a theory called peak car. I believe that um, we're very, very close to a scenario in which the sharing economy will merge with autonomous cars and the economics will be so compelling that not many of us 
will own a car. Now, as it happens, I live out in the sticks a little bit, and I'm, I guess that it's not very likely I'm going to start sharing a car with people. But the majority of people live in cities, and increasingly, cars are becoming an irrelevance. Which begs the question, if you're not going to own a car, you're going to share a car instead, and that's going to be more efficient, less cars are going to be made, which is perhaps a good thing, but what's going to happen to the car industry? Also on the subject of ownership, economic theory says price is a fun function of marginal cost. So marginal cost is the um, cost, is the, when you're producing a good, it's the cost of that last unit of that good. So economic theory says overheads isn't what determines price, it's marginal cost. And in a digital environment, marginal cost is zero, which is why we're seeing free web, websites, the, the rise of websites with with, um, that you don't pay for anymore, which is a nightmare for journalists trying to make a living. Um, you see the rise of products such as Linux, GlaxoSmithKline looking at an open standard in malaria. But if products are free, who will own the rights? And for that matter, who cares if the products are free? Another one is Bitcoins on the Again, I'm talking in the context of um, ownership. Bitcoins are seen as a libertarian dream. Central banks and the government will lose control over the money if Bitcoins take over as becoming the, the world's major currency. And a lot of people are really excited about that. They think that's a great thing. But if, if central banks and governments lose ownership of the currency and lose the ability to create money and set interest rates, I believe that would be a, permanent, a recipe for permanent economic depression. In, a, in, a, in an age of technology re, evolu, revolution, inequality and job losses could soar. And one of the solutions to that, well, if you've got lots and lots of plenty, there's plenty of, there's plenty of potential capacity, but there just aren't, people aren't doing the jobs in order to be able to afford to pay for the goods and services that you could produce, the solution to that could be to print money. But if you have the Bitcoin, that luxury is removed. Um, then there's the issue in this great technological revolution that I'm talking about of who will own wealth and capital. At its peak, Kodak employed 145,000 people. You can see the figures for yourself. Apple only employs 47, Facebook 7,000 people. There's no doubt about it, technology, technology is having a hollowing out effect, and it might well be the reason. I believe if you really dig down deep, you'll find the reason why we've seen a sharp rise in inequality in recent years. Technology has got something to do with it. Of course, there's a counter-argument to that. Uh, Deloitte has argued that Facebook and products associated with Facebook have created 4.5 million jobs. But right now, or at least about a year ago, um, profits in the US to GD GDP were the highest ever. The only time they were almost as high was in 2006 and in 1929. Now, I believe that technology is, is linked to that. Now, that might seem like a good thing, profits are high. Well, no, it's not, because if profits are high to GDP, that means the other side of the equation must have fallen, and the other side of the equation is wages. And sure enough, wages to GDP are, at the, in the US, are at the lowest ever recorded. And there's also the question of technology and the impact that it can have on the ownership of our own thoughts. There are concepts such as groupthink, which you might all be familiar with when, uh, in a group, we tend to go along with what the rest of the group says. Well, there's a thing called group polarization. If you put a group of people who are mildly risk averse together and um, put them in a group, then the group becomes terrified of making a decision. If you put a group of people together who are willing to make the odd, odd mild risk every, gamble every now and again, put them in a group, and the group becomes mad risk takers. There's lots of research to support that. Or there's the issue of bias. These days, or Larry, Larry Page has said that he wants Google to be able to supply us with information before we even know that we want it. But if search engines become so good that they supply the information that we want, is there not a danger that that might confirm our view? So if our view is, I don't know, 
we're very cynical about climate change or we're very anti-immigration, for example. Regardless of the rights or wrongs of those arguments, if you only see um, media coverage that supports those arguments, you'll become totally convinced that you're right. And I think that's, that's a danger. Okay, so we're on the verge of the uh, greatest technolog technology revolution ever. And there's one of two ways that can go. Um, there is a danger that humanity might make the mistake that Robert Johnson made and sell its soul. Um, and if we do that, we will go on a highway to hell. But if we play it right, technology can create an age of, of plenty. And if we do that, it could be a stairway to heaven. Thank you.